Section 23 of Astounding Stories of Super Science, September 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Richard Elwood. Earth, the Marauder, by Arthur J. Burks. Chapter Twenty. Sarka commands again. Ahead through the storms which still hung tenaciously to the roof of the world flashed those dozen air cars of the moon. Now Sarka could plainly see the dome of his laboratory, and from the depths of him welled up that strange glow which earthlings recognize as the joy of returning home, than which there is none save the love for a woman greater. Now he could see the effect of those flares, or lights from Mars, which impinged on the face of the earth, though he could see no purpose in them, no reason for their being, since they seemed to do no damage at all, though the effect of them was weird in the extreme. Outer darkness rent with ripping, roaring storms, Flurries of ice, snow, and sleet, shot through and through by balls of lambent flames in unguessable numbers. Every light which struck the surface of the earth bounded away and, half a mile or so from the surface again, burst into flaming pinwheels like skyrockets of ancient times. Strange lights, causing weird effects but producing no damage at all, save to lessen to some extent the courage of earthlings, because they did not understand these things. And always, down the ages, man had stood most in fear of the unknown. Sarka peered off across the heavens where a ball of flame now seemed to be rising over the horizon, and was amazed at the size of this planet. Mars was close to Earth, so close that, had they possessed air cars like those of the moon people, which remained to be seen, they could easily have attacked the Earth. Across the face of the earth flashed those fiery will-o'-the-wisps from Mars, without rhyme or reason, yet Sarka knew positively that they possessed some meaning, and that the earth had been forced thus close to Mars for a purpose. What that purpose was must yet be discovered. Then, under the air cars, the laboratory of Sarka. Down dropped the air cars to a landing near the laboratory, and to the cubes in the fore peak of each, Sarka sent the mental command. Assure yourselves that the air cars will remain where they are. Muster inside the laboratory, keeping well away from the master barrel. Then to the people who had returned, clothed in strange radiance, from the moon with Sarka and with Jaska, he spoke. Leave the cars and enter my laboratory, where further orders will be given you. With Jaska still by his side, Sarka entered the laboratory through the exit dome. Inside, clothing was swiftly brought for the rebels, for Sarka and for Jaska. But even when they were clothed, these people who had come back seemed to glow with an inner radiance which transfigured them. Sarka the second, his face drawn and pale, came from the observatory to meet his son, and the two were clasped in each other's arms for a moment. Sarka the second, who had looked no older than his son, seemed to have aged a dozen centuries in the time Sarka had been gone. But it was not of the threatened attack by Martians that Sarka the second spoke. He made no statement. He merely asked a question. Was Lunar very beautiful? and just a bit unearthly in appearance? Sarka started. Yes, beautiful, wondrously, fearfully beautiful, but I had the feeling that she had no heart or soul, no conscience, that she was somehow, well, bestial. A moan of anguish escaped Sarka the second. Dalius again, he ejaculated, but much of the fault was mine. Before you were born, we scientists of Earth had already several times realized the necessity of expansion for the children of Earth, if they were to continue. 
Dalius's proposal to my father was discarded because it involved the wholesale taking of life. But after the oceans had been obliterated and the human family still outgrew its bounds, Delius came to my father and me with still another proposal. It involved a strange, otherworldly young woman whom he called Lunar. Her family? Well, nothing was known about her, for her family could not be traced. Wiped out, I presume, in some inter-family quarrel, leaving her alone. Dalius found her, took an interest in her, and the very strangeness of her gave him his idea, which he brought to my father and me. His proposal was somewhat like that which you made when we sent the Earth out of its orbit into outer space, save that Dalius's scheme involved no such program. His was simply a proposal to somehow communicate with the moon by the use of an interplanetary rocket that should carry a human passenger. He put the idea up to this girl, Lunar, and she did not seem to care one way or another. Dalius was all wrapped up in his ideas, and gave the girl the name of Lunar as being symbolical of his plans for her. He coached and trained her against the consummation of his plan. We knew something, theoretically at least, about the conditions on the moon, and everything possible was done for her to make it feasible for her to exist on the moon. My error was in ever permitting the experiment to be made, since if I had negatived the idea, Dalius would have gone no further. But I, too, was curious, and Lunar did not care. Well, the rocket was constructed and shot outward into space by a series of explosions. No word was ever received from Lunar, though it was known that she landed on the moon. I say no word was ever received, yet what you have intimated proves that Dalius has either been in mental communication with her, hoping to induce her to send a force against the earth, and assist him in mastering the earth, overthrowing we Sarkas, or has been biding his time against something of the thing we have now accomplished. This seemed to clear up many things for Sarka, though it piled higher upon his shoulders the weight of his responsibilities. The otherworldliness of Lunar, now called Luar, explained her mastery of the gnomes, and through them the cubes and her knowledge of the omnipotent qualities of the white flames of the moon's core, which might have been, it came to Sarka in a flash, the source of all life on the moon in the beginning. But father, went on Sarka, I don't see any sense in this aerial bombardment by Mars. I believe, said Sarka the Second sadly, that before another ten hours pass we shall know the worst there is to be known. But now, son, instead of going back into attack against the moon, we go into battle against the combined forces of Mars and of the moon. Sarka now took command of the forces of the earth. Swiftly he turned to the people of the Gens of Dalius who had come back with him. You will be divided into eleven equal groups, as nearly as possible. Father, will you please arrange the division? Each group will be attached to the staff of one of the spokesmen of the Gens, so that each spokesman will have the benefit of your knowledge with reference to conditions on the moon. Each group will re-enter its particular air car, retaining control of the cube in each case, of course, and will at once repair to his proper station. Telepathy is the mode of communication with the cubes, and you rule them by your will. Each group, when assembled by my father, will choose a leader before quitting this laboratory, and such leader will remain in command of his group, under the overlordship of the spokesman to whom he reports with his group. You understand. Your loyalty is unquestioned. You will consecrate your lives to the welfare of the Gens to which you are going, since you no longer have a Gens of your own. Sarka turned to the cubes, which had formed in a line just inside the exit dome, and issued a mental command to the cube that had piloted his air car from the moon. The cube faded out instantly, appearing immediately afterward on the table of the very-colored lights. Father, said Sarka, 
while i am issuing orders to the spokesmen please see if you can discover the secret of these cubes how they are actuated the real extent of their intelligence the rest of you with your cubes depart immediately and report to your new gens within ten minutes the divisions had been made and the radiant people had entered the air cars and outside the laboratory risen free of the earth and turned each in its proper direction for the gens of its assignment the sarkas and jaska watched them go there remained but one air car standing outside on half a dozen of those grim tentacles with two tentacles swinging free undulating to and fro like serpents harnessed electricity actuating the tentacles, cars and tentacles subservient to the cubes. The air cars safely on their way, Sarka stepped to the master barrel, turned it down to normal speed, and signaled the spokesman of the Gens. The moon and Mars are in alliance against us, and Dalius has allied himself and his Gens with the ruler of the moon. I don't know yet what form the attack will take, but know this, that the safety of the world, of all its people, rests in your hands, and that the war into which we are going is potentially more vast than expected when this venture began, and more devastating than the fight with the air cars of the moon. Coming to you in air cars which we manage to take from the moon people are such of the people of the Gens of Dalius as were able to return with me. Question them. Gather all the information you can about them, and through them keep control of the cubes which pilot the air cars. For in the cubes, I believe, lies the secret of our possible victory in the fight to come. Sarka scarcely knew why he had spoken the last sentence. It was though something deep within him had risen up, commanded him to speak, and deeper yet, Far back in his consciousness was a mental picture of the devastation he had witnessed on his flight above the area that had once housed the Gens of Dalius. For in that ghastly area, he believed, was embodied an idea greater than more wanton destruction, just as there was an idea back in the fiery lights from Mars greater than mere display. Somehow the two were allied, and Sarka believed that, between the blue column and the fiery lights from Mars, the fate of the world rested. He could, he believed, by manipulation of the barrels that yet remained, maneuver the world away from that blue column, which on the earth was invisible. But to have done so would have thwarted the very purpose for which this mad voyage had begun. The world had been startled on its mad journey into space for the purpose of attacking and colonizing the moon and Mars. The moon had been colonized by the Gens of Dalius, already in potential revolt against the Earth. Mars was next, and by forcing the Earth into close proximity to Mars, the people of the moon had played into the hands of the Earth people. If the people of Earth were capable of carrying out the program of expansion originally proposed by Sarka. If they were not, well, Sarka thought somewhat grimly, the resultant cataclysmic war would at least solve the problem of overpopulation. Inasmuch as the Earth was already committed to whatever might transpire, Sarka believed he should take a philosophic view of the matter. Sarka turned to an examination of the master barrel, and even as he peered into the depths of it, he thought gratefully how nice it was to be home again, in his own laboratory, upon the world of his nativity. He even found it within his heart to feel somewhat sorry for Dalius, and to feel ashamed that he had, even in his heart, mistreated him. Then he thought, with a tightening of his jaw muscles, of the casual way in which Dalius had destroyed Sarka the first, of his forcing his people to undergo the terrors of the Lake of the White Flames, without telling them the simple secret of his betrayal of the earth in his swift alliance with Luar, or Luar herself, when, as Lunar a strange waif of earth, Dalius had sent her out as the first human passenger aboard a rocket to the moon. All his pity vanished, though he still believed he had done right in sparing Dalius's life. 
Suddenly there came an ominous humming in the barrel, and simultaneously signals from the very colored lights on the table. Sarka whirled to the lights, noting their color, and mentally repeating the names of the spokesmen who signaled them. Even before he gave the signal that placed him in position to converse with them, he noted the strange coincidence. The spokesmen who desired speech with him were tutelary heads of the Gens, whose borders touched the devastated area where Dalius had but recently been overlord. An icy chill caressed his spine as he signaled the spokesman to speak. Yes, Vardi, Prul, Classer, Cleric. The report of each of them was substantially the same, though touched in different words, words freighted heavily with strange terror. The devastated area has suddenly broken into movement. Throughout that portion of it, visible from my Gens area, the fused mass of debris is bubbling, fermenting, walking into life. An aura of unearthly menace seems to flow outward from this heaving mass, and the whole is assumed a most peculiar radiance, cold gleaming, like distant starshine. Wait, replied Sarka swiftly. Wait until the people I have sent you have arrived. Report to me instantly if the movement of the mass is noticeably augmented, and especially so if it seems to be breaking up, or coagulating into any sort of form whatever. Then he dimmed the lights, indicating that, for the moment, there was nothing more to be said. Just then his father, face very gray and very old, entered the room of the master barrel from the laboratory. Son, he said, the crisis is almost upon us. The Martians are coming. End of section 23 Recording by Richard Elwood, 